morning church my name is Moses and I'll be reading for you the scriptures for today and I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 5 to Exodus chapter 7 I'll be skip, uh, skipping a couple of portions uh, but for today we're focusing on Exodus 5 verses 1 to 9 Exodus 5 uh, verse 19 to Exodus 6 verse 8 and Exodus chapter 7 from verse 1 to verse 7 and I'll read after this presentation to Israel leaders Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh they told him this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so? retorted Pharaoh. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. But Aaron and Moses persisted. The God of the Hebrews has met with us, they declared. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so that we can offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If we don't, he will kill us with a plague or with a sword. Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting people from their tasks? Get back to work. Look, there are many of your people in the land and you are stopping them from their work. That same day, Pharaoh sent an order to the Egyptian slave drivers and to the Israelite foremen. Do not supply any more straw from brick for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves but still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them not to listen to lies. The Israelite foremen could see that they were in serious trouble when they were told, you must not reduce the number of bricks you make each day. As they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron who were waiting outside for them. The foreman said to them, May the Lord judge you and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You have put a sword in their hands, an excuse to kill us. Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested, Why have you brought all this trouble on your people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has even been more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing to rescue them. Then the Lord told Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. When he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. And I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of, Can of Canaan, where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I will be heard you can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel, who are now slaves to the Egyptians, and I am well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and I will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and with great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give, you as your very, I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. Chapter 7. Aaron's staff becomes a serpent. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I command you, and Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so that I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even, though, even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so I will bring down my feast on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand, and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they made their demands to Pharaoh. That's the word of the Lord. Good morning, LBC. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Deborah Kimathi and I have the honor of serving uh, alongside the elder team here at LBC. Um, and as we look forward to regathering physically in the coming weeks, it's great to be able to be with you this morning uh, via YouTube um, or however you're joining us. 
Um, this morning we continue in our series of uh, in Exodus uh, and building on what Pastor Jeremy has been sharing with us over the last couple of weeks. Today we're diving into Exodus chapters 5 to 7. And in these chapters, we walk with Moses on his journey of knowing, trusting and obeying God. And we'll see how he first had to know God to be able to trust God and then obey God in this journey of deliverance for the Israelites. Um, so let's pray before we begin. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, gathering us this morning um, as we sit uh, in our homes, in our gardens, um, perhaps in our small groups with our families to gather around your word. And Lord, we just pray that as we do so, that you would come and meet with us, that you would be present amongst us, that you would speak to us, that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would open our minds and our hearts to be able to hear from you, to learn from you, and that you would draw us closer to you. Help us, even in this story of, of so many thousands of years ago, to see ourselves, to learn from it, um, and as an end result, to just get to know you better. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. So I'm not sure if the phrase, a long way round for a shortcut, is particularly Scottish, and Google, in all its wisdom, didn't seem to be able to tell me either. But it's the phrase that was ringing through my mind as I read the story of Moses in Exodus chapters 5 to 7. Now, Moz might tell you, um, husband Moz, not Moses in Exodus, that I'm an annoying backseat driver. Now, of course, in my opinion, I'm just trying to keep everybody safe and efficient on the roads. Now, one of our common disagreements in the car when Moz is driving and worries that we might be headed into bad traffic is that he'll turn off from our road home or wherever we're going and proceed to follow another route completely. A route that's neither direct nor shorter, but he thinks will get us to our destination faster. Now, many a journey, this has taken us a very roundabout route. Definitely not direct, definitely not straightforward, and often not faster than just sticking to the traffic jam. Moz would rather drive many kilometers than slow down for traffic. Hence, the phrase applies, a long way round for a shortcut. A journey that was seemingly longer and more tiring than it needed to be. Now, in many ways, today's passage from Exodus is all about Moses taking a long way round for a shortcut. Chapter four ends with Moses and Aaron seemingly making final preparations for their mission to save the Israelites, to see them released from slavery. God has commissioned them, sent them on their way, and the pieces seem to be falling into place. They meet the elders of Israel just uh, according to plan, reveal what God has told them, demonstrate God's miraculous power as instructed, and they're all in agreement that they're good to go. Chapter four ends with them celebrating and worshiping together. And I can just imagine them that evening, perhaps once the crowd has gone home on some kind of euphoric high, convinced of what God will do, psyched up for the task ahead and feeling unstoppable. And chapter five starts with Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. Fairly simply stated, but they were going to meet with the ruler of all of Egypt, who had already proven himself to be hard of heart, a cruel oppressor and an egomaniac. And they were going to make a pretty audacious ask, let my people go. They were putting in jeopardy Egyptian systems of production, systems that allowed the Egyptians to thrive and get richer by the day but also systems that oppressed the Israelites who were enslaved. Had everything gone according to Moses' plan that first day in that first interaction, Moses and Aaron were essentially putting the, pulling the entire workforce out from Pharaoh's feet and in the process threatening his wealth, his power, his dominance and his reputation. So here they are in front of Pharaoh and they tell him, basically, we had an amazing encounter with our God and we want to go celebrate with all of our people in the wilderness for three days. That's chapter five, verse one. And Pharaoh basically seems to laugh them out of his presence. His response, who is Yahweh? Why should I listen to him? I don't know him 
and nor will I grant your request. Now, let's pause here for a slight detour. Uh, many of you are familiar with Bible Project and we've used their videos several times um, at LVC. Um, and Tim Mackey is one of the main uh, theologians behind the Bible Project. And he has this great uh, video sermon that helps us understand this use of Yahweh in the, this portion of the Old Testament. Now he spends about an hour diving into Hebrew, the original language of the text, and dissecting it and its grammar, but allow me to attempt to sum it up in a few sentences. Tim explains how throughout the Old Testament and other ancient texts, the word Elohim is basically used as some kind of generic name for God. So God with a small g, as it were. Now, Elohim could in theory be any God of any people anywhere. And in all of the time periods represented through the scriptures, there were in fact many gods with a small g again. Gods rooted in different cultures, different belief systems, different religions, different ethnicities, geographies, the list goes on. Now Tim in his sermon likens it to the fact that there are many Tims in any one city or many Deborahs in any one city. Now, whenever someone in Nairobi mentions Deborah or Debs, they're not necessarily talking about me. <laughs> any number of people could be referencing any number of Deborahs. And it's the same for this generic name Elohim. It means different things to different people. If you talk about Elohim, you could be talking about this God or that God. Just the same way as you talk about a Deborah, you could be talking about me or some completely different person. Now, Tim goes on to explain that we differentiate the various gods by their stories, by our experiences of them, just as we do with people. And he points to the very first verse of scripture, Genesis 1, 1 as an example. God, the one who created the earth. I.e. not just any old God, but God, capital G, the creator of the universe. Now at God's encounter with Moses in the burning bush, God reveals his true name, his unique identifier as it were, Yahweh. Whenever we see Lord written in the scripture in capital letters, it's typically a translation from Yahweh, not Elohim. Yahweh is not just any old God. Yahweh is the true God, the creator of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh is translated as I am who I am, or I shall be who I shall be. Kind of like this present ongoing tense, I am and I will continue to be God. So what strikes me then as we come full circle back to Exodus chapter five, is that Pharaoh seems to refer to God as Yahweh, likely mirroring the way that Moses and Aaron have referred to him as they made their pleas a few moments before. Now Pharaoh has no idea who this Yahweh is. He has no sense of his power, no sense of his story, no experience of his character, and zero regard for whoever Yahweh might be. And here we see an important point for us to be able to hear from God, to be able to receive God's word or to follow instruction from God, we have to know him. We have to know his story. We have to be familiar with his character so that we can follow in his ways. If you know me well, for example, when somebody starts to talk about a Deborah, you will likely be able to determine if they're talking about me or somebody else entirely. And in this day and age, when we see people worship and devote their lives to a, a whole range of gods, gods with small g's, do we know how to recognize our God, Yahweh? Do we know the one we worship to the extent that we recognize him by his character, by his story, by his endless pursuit of our redemption? Do we recognize that one true God by his presence? So next in our story, in chapter 5, verse 4, we see Pharaoh dismiss Moses and Aaron, agitated by their ask. Then almost just to reiterate his power, his control, his oppression of the people of Israel, he issues instructions that will make their work harder, exploit them further and increase their suffering. 
If the Israelites thought they had somehow heard from God, Pharaoh would teach them a thing or two and maybe even completely distract them. The Israelites cry out, blaming Moses and Aaron, perhaps rightly so, for this injustice. Chapter 5 verse 21 says, The foreman said to them, May the Lord judge and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You have put a sword in their hands, an excuse to kill us. So Moses then goes back to God, perhaps wondering how on earth he got it so wrong, asking himself if he really heard God correctly. And we read in chapter 5 verse 22, Moses challenging God, Why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he's been even more brutal to your people. And you've done nothing to rescue them. Almost accusing God. Now, bear in mind that when God was sending Moses to Pharaoh, he pretty much predicted this increased suffering. He said to Moses that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened, which is essentially exactly what happened. His heart was indeed hardened, and as a result, he treated the Israelites worse than ever. In chapter 4, verse 21, God told Moses, when you arrive back in Egypt, go to Pharaoh, perform all the miracles I've empowered you to do, but I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Moses and Aaron, despite having heard this prediction directly from God, expected it to be much more straightforward than it was. How often do we listen without really hearing? How often do we interpret God's word to make it what we want to hear? Do we twist the word of God, even when on a righteous mission, to say something that it doesn't? To seemingly quicken the pace of justice? God's deliverance does not always look how we would plan it. So chapter 6 begins with God reiterating his promise of deliverance from chapter 3. He tells Moses that Pharaoh will feel the force of my strong hand and let my people go. In fact, in chapter 3, God has already told Moses that Pharaoh will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. However, on this first trip to see Pharaoh, Moses doesn't follow God's instructions exactly. Perhaps on a high from the worship session with the elders where they endorsed his mission to Pharaoh, instead of taking the elders with him and following the instructions about what he should say issued in chapter 4, Moses goes it alone with Aaron and strays a little or a lot from the script. He seems to want to fast forward to the end. He didn't even perform the miracles for Pharaoh that God had empowered him to do. It's almost like Moses figured that since he and God were after the same end goal, he could make up his own script to get there. Moses thought he knew better and he mapped out his own script and his own journey. And this disobedience is perhaps why the Israelites did not leave Egypt with the riches and favour highlighted at the end of chapter 3. So out of frustration and seemingly having failed at his calling, Moses finds himself once again speaking to God. Despite his many faults, there's something important Moses models for us here. He went back to God in his failure. He didn't run away. He didn't try to hide from God. He went looking for God in his shame, in his frustration, and in his disappointment. There's no better place to take these burdens. When we feel shame or frustration, disappointment, whether in ourselves or in others, that's when God wants to hold us, remind us of who he is. Remind us that he is our God, who saves. He wants to refresh our memory of the stories of redemption woven throughout history. Reading on from verse 22 of chapter 5, it says, So Moses went back to the Lord and protested, Why have you brought all of this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesperson, he's been even more brutal to your people, and you've done nothing to rescue them. But the Lord told Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. 
When he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let my people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob at El Shaddai, God Almighty. But I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. And I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel who are now slaves to the Egyptians. And I'm well aware of my covenant with them. As Moses takes his disappointment to God, God reassures him of his promise, past, present and future. Moses makes this important move going back to God before he's sent out once more. Just as we see throughout the Bible, this idea of returning to God's presence, retreating to God's presence before the big stuff, even in the life of Jesus. Moses seems to, despite his issue, somehow trust in God's guidance, trust in God's presence, trust in God's promise, even if he can't seem to fully figure it out. God wants us to bring our burdens, our brokenness to him, and he wants us to trust him enough to do so, even when we feel our most lost or let down. God listens to Moses offload, and then he restates his promise of deliverance, restates his covenant with Israel. His prom he promises to lend his strength so that Moses can see that promise fulfilled. Moses' trust in God is reassured by this reiteration of God's promise. And the same goes for us when we feel lost or desolate, even let down by God. Going back to God, seeking out his presence, allows him to reassure us, to remind us of his character, to remind us of his promise, of his goodness, past, present and future. This passage in chapter 6 is also where we see the theme of redemption spoken of for the first time actually in scripture. And we begin to see how this story of Exodus, this story of salvation, this story of rescue sets the tone for the rest of scripture and the rest of history. It begins to tell a story of redemption and rescue that's retold over and over and reaches its climax in the life and death of Jesus. Do you trust God's promise of deliverance? Do you trust in God's promise of redemption? As you sit now in your suffering, in your darkness, in your oppression, whatever that may be, do you believe God's promise? As you push back against oppression, systemic or otherwise, do you trust in God's rescue plan? As we all continue to live in this now and not yet of God's kingdom, of God's promise, where we, we have a taste of his deliverance, but we're waiting for it in full. Do we trust in him? Do we really know our God? Do we see his character shining through all of the stories we know of his love and his forgiveness and restoration? Do we see his big plan for our redemption woven through history, playing out in our lives? Do we know him well enough to recognize him at work? Do we know him well enough to trust his promise? In chapter 6, verse 7, God restates his promise of redemption to Moses and he says, I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God, Yahweh. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from oppression in Egypt. It is in God's act of redemption that the people of Israel will know him to be their God. It's in this realization, this experience, that he is indeed the God who saves, the God who rescues, the God who redeems. That's where we get to know him as our God. It's in their experience of the character of God that they see him and they know him. It's God, in God's rescue of us that we know him. It's in God's saving of us that we know him. 
Now it's at this point where Moses has gone back to God frustrated and disappointed that God reminds Moses that he is indeed El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God who provides, God who is sufficient, God who is powerful enough to win the battle, powerful enough to overthrow an oppressor like Pharaoh, God who will give Moses every word, every strength and every instruction he needs to fulfill his calling on his life. And this seems to be a turning point for Moses, where he really begins to trust God. He shifts from saying, I can't and I won't, to saying, I can't, but God can and we will. And this trust initiates his obedience. So now we see Moses, humbled by his first failure, carrying the weight of his disobedience and its resultant suffering for the Israelites, for his people. Now he begins to follow God's instructions. God sends him to speak to the people of Israel. Moses goes, follows God's instructions, but the people are not interested. The last time they listened to Moses, it didn't go so well for them. And now they were, as it says in verse nine, too discouraged by the brutality of their own suffering. And so God sends Moses back to Pharaoh. As usual, Moses protests. You'd think he'd have figured this thing out by now, but he's still human, still insecure, still imagining that this whole process in some way relies on his own strength rather than on God's. But God commands Moses and Aaron to go. He gives them instructions and they set off on their way. Now, right here in chapter six, we rather abruptly, it seems, have our story interrupted with this long genealogy of Moses and Aaron. It appears rather out of place, almost like a printing error and a little confusion, confusing. Scholars have a number of theories as to why or how it's there. But one theory is that this point in the story is the point where Moses finally begins to trust and to obey and therefore marks the beginning of a new season for Moses, almost a rebirth. And that placement of the genealogy is said to, to emphasize this. This may be so, and we definitely see a shift in Moses' demeanor here. And finally, in chapter seven, verse six, we read, so Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. Moses is finally ready to fulfill God's calling on his life. He's finally ready to do all the things that God has been mapping out for him to do. What readies him? Not some fancy degree or some new set of tools or weapons, not some Toastmaster training or executive coaching. He's finally ready to simply obey. He's gotten to know and experience God and he trusts God because of that experience. He's finally ready to let God work in and through him without fighting back, without making up his own script, without thinking he knows better. Moses is ready to obey and to move forwards in that obedience. You almost get the sense that chapters three to six represent Moses kind of going in circles back and forth to Pharaoh, the Israelites, focused on his own inability. He's stuck. He's not moving forward. Nothing is going according to plan. Now, of course, it's not all smooth sailing from here on out, as we know. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He needed 10 horrific plagues before he let God's people go. And even then he still chased after them. But now Moses was going along with God's plan. God was acting alongside him, or rather he was acting alongside God. And it's at this point that the deliverance we see in Exodus really begins. After all the back and forth, all the questionings, the distractions, the disobedience, now Moses has begun to trust and obey and can fulfill that which God has called him to. I wonder how different it would have been if he had done this at the get-go. Did Moses delay the deliverance and rescue of his fellow Israelites? Do we delay our own deliverance by rushing ahead of God? Do we delay our own deliverance through our disobedience? Now, I recognize there's a tricky conversation lurking in the background here about the relationship between disobedience and suffering or deliverance from oppression and the relationship between waiting for God's help and how our own actions or lack thereof delay our rescue. And 
whilst this is a whole other topic, I don't think God causes all of our suffering or that our suffering is always a direct result of our disobedience. However, I am sure that our human understanding of suffering, of wellness, of wholeness are incomplete and it's all more complex than we might understand. But as we consider this passage, as we consider the story of Exodus, how often do we skim over this period of waiting, the in-between where Moses is battling with disobedience, struggling to trust God? The Sunday school version of this story jumps straight from God appearing to Moses at the burning bush to Pharaoh letting God's people go. We don't often dwell on this period of waiting. We don't look closely at this period. Yet it's at this time in which Moses gets to know God, builds his trust in God, and finally figures out that he needs to obey God. It was in this waiting period that God reveals himself to Moses in a way that shifted his mindset, shifted his worldview from, I can't, I'm just Moses, to I can because Yahweh goes with me and before me. We all experience seasons of seemingly waiting for God, struggling with ongoing suffering or oppression. And we might be tempted to ask, where is God in our suffering? Where is God in our struggle, in our waiting? There's no doubt that God is with us in the waiting, with us in the suffering. When God revealed himself to Moses as Yahweh before, Moses started going in all these circles. The grammar used as God introduces himself as Yahweh is this present ongoing tense. This idea that God is with him there and then and for all time uh, going forward. When Moses gets frustrated and goes to look for God, he doesn't struggle to find him. God is there waiting on Moses. In our waiting, in our suffering, in our trying to figure it all out, even in our battling with God, he's with us. He is present. God, Yahweh, is by definition with us. It's his character, not just a passing event. And while we're waiting, perhaps even experiencing increased suffering, perhaps it is in this season in which we, like Moses, will get to know God, build our trust in God, and finally figure out how we need to obey God. Whether we're fighting for deliverance from our own personal struggles or fighting for the deliverance of God's children from systems of oppression, or indeed both, as was in Moses' case here in Exodus. The need to know God, to trust God and to obey God are clear. Obviously, let's pray together. Lord, we pray for those who are in this season of waiting, this season of struggle, wishing for their own deliverance, wishing for their own rescue, waiting for you. We pray that this would be a season where each of us would realize just the reality of your presence, realize the reality of who you are as God, Yahweh. To look back over these stories and recognize you and your plan for our lives, recognize your plan of love, of forgiveness, of redemption and of restoration. Help us even as we continue to struggle in darkness, Help us to know you in new ways, to know your plan for our lives, to know your love for us and your desire to redeem us. And as we get to know you, Lord, help us to trust you and to obey you. Show us your ways. Reveal yourself to us like you did to Moses. Instruct us. Teach us to follow your instructions. Help us to trust you enough to obey you with each and everything. And Lord, in doing so, we pray that you would rescue us. Each of us individually, collectively as a whole, Lord, save us. Save us from 
oppression, save us from our own personal struggles with sin, save us from the darkness, whatever that might be for each of us. Rescue us and draw us closer to you. And as we wait for you, as we respond to you, as you teach us, Lord, draw us closer to you in the same way you did with Moses. Help us to know you. Help us to obey you. Help us to trust you. And we pray these things in your name. Thanks so much for joining us this morning, LVC. Uh, may God be with you in the coming week. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. God bless. Thank you.